Uh, good morning. I, I'd like to tell you about a laboratory module. That we um, so, yeah, I mean, the nice thing is diffusion is, is so core to chemistry. It gets used in almost, you know, to help explain the fundamentals of most types of reactions, electrochemistry, everything. A lot of things get diffusion limited or diffusion controlled. And so, you know, understanding it at a fundamental aspect uh, becomes very important. So you can look at things that are very fundamental and very uh, complicated. Uh, I just saw some cute little examples here of looking at critical micelle formation where you see the diffusion coefficient is essentially constant until the onset of micelle formation and you see it drop off with increasing concentration one, of micelles. I love um, examples from, where, from you know, they use Dozy now to, you know, wait and be able to look at different components. I think that's one of the things that diffusion starting to get used for more and more in NMR is going to play a huge role in the future. So Yeah, yeah. And so, so uh, I'll go, yeah, molecular dynamics, I mean, uh, this has really been a game changer for teaching diffusion. You know, NMR is such a fundamental component to understanding diffusion from a research standpoint as far as experimentally being able to measure it, but it can often be a little abstract of the data you get and how you extract diffusion coefficient to what is actually diffusing and how. And so, especially when they're learning this at the early stages in undergraduate chemistry, you know, molecular dynamics gives you real ways to visualize it. And what I love most about molecular dynamics codes compared to other things like electronic structure calculations and other you know it's dominated by freeware and and we have decided to use NAMD not another molecular dynamics simulation code but it's supported by the NIH there's great tutorials the visual molecular dynamics is a, a great program that's free for all operating systems and so it's really easy for and in looking at these two pictures you can immediately Get a, start to get a real feel for how it changes from an undergrad perspective of thinking that it's just gas phase diffusion or bowling balls hitting each other. Now they can look at this simulation cell, drill down in the center and see just how crowded and how much water, the, the sea of water that surrounds this simple solute. Um, and even in this conditions, we're able to, on desktop computers, go out to a decently long simulation time of approximately 200 picoseconds um, and get, start to you know, calculate what is really going on in this diffusion. So then that's where we'll go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the thing I like about, so you're right, like they do a, a small enough simulation that it, it doesn't give the most accurate diffusion results because we don't go out long enough in time and don't make the boxes with waters big enough to where, you know, periodic things can come into play, et cetera. But, but you know, uh, and, and this is really a kind of, a, I think, one of the things students get most out of it is they can run, you know, the same simulation and, and look at the vast differences in trajectories you can get from run to run, and you kind of have to average them to give you anything, you know, uh, that makes any sense at all, and, and then you can do them for different solutes. Yeah, to so, so get which ones. in addition to that picture of, of the sea of water in your solute in the middle, one of the, um, the most important thing they see is now you can take that solute and remove the water and show where it's gone as a function of time, and you get this very good representation of Brownian motion of that molecule moving throughout the water box and through all those collisions. Um, and this is able to really benefit them in the, getting a fundamental handle of what goes on. Um, it's so impactful. That and so, but like you said, Brian, like, uh, you know, really at the heart of this and, and the heart of this uh, session is to talk about using NMR, um, you know, to measure diffusion. And it is one of the seminal techniques to measure diffusion in the liquid state. Um, and, you know, it has even made its way into standard, you know, kind of physical chemistry textbooks now. And most people just talk about standard pulse field gradient spin echo, you know, one of the simplest. But no matter how complicated you get this to compensate for convective motions or exchange or other things, it ends up still using, you know, the same Stutzkel Tanner equation, you know, to describe this, which is you can just watch the decrease in the signal or the magnetization, the signal that you observe, which is proportional to the diffusion coefficient. Um, and then the, these are a bunch of constants, you know, of the experiment, uh, the different time delays and, and the gyromagnetic ratio. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and then it's, it's very easy, you know, to, to back out the diffusion coefficient just by looking at how the signal decreases as you either change the gradient strength, um, you know, in the experiment or change, you know, the time delay in the experiment. And this is a very classic thing that's done now. It's a, we don't even need to describe it in much detail. It's described in detail so many places that to be able to use pulse field um, gradient um, 
to measure diffusion, and we can do it of a whole bunch of analytes, simple solutes in the water box, the same ones they did in MD, and we can run them all in one tube, all at the same time, you know, uh, the students get one set of data, you can assign a different molecule to each student and they can determine the diffusion coefficient. You can then have them pull their data, does it make sense, things with bigger molecular weights, do they do diffuse a little slower, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, you can implement this thing that is commonly done, you know, in the literature today or in research today to look at diffusion in the liquid state and give this to the, the students with what I would call you know, just kind of modern NMR technology, which is to have a modern, um, you know, supracon magnet with a with a, a single axis gradient um, uh, uh, pulse field gradient probe or, or a gradient on your uh, NMR probe, uh, and this is all just doing proton NMR. So when you're teaching this, it's also a really good idea, um, a, good, a good opportunity to introduce the direct relationship of NMR and MRI to students. Because um, you're actually going to take advantage of, you know, that your NMR can do imaging um, and you can use it to calibrate your gradients with a simple phantom in the middle of the known size and you get this space, this void that's taken away and you can use it to calculate your strength. Um, but also, what's also equally important in measuring diffusion is not only knowing accurately what the strength of the gradients that your probe provides, but also you need to have a really good control over your temperature. Um, in order to do that correctly, um, in order to get the correct numbers. Um, so typically, when, when we set up diffusion experiments, we're, we're calibrating on pure D2O at 25 degrees C, because we know that the diffusion coefficient is of that, um, use that to all, uh, completely set up our system. Yeah. yeah, and like I said earlier, this shows kind of uh, the 10 component, you know, analyte system or solute system we're using uh, that you can easily set up, you know, watch the decay in intensity as you increase the gradient strength, uh, plot the log of that versus, you know, all the constants, um, and easily extract out the diffusion coefficient for a, a whole ton. You can, you know, you could choose whatever you want, you know, whatever you can resolve in your NMR naturally, which has a huge resolution power NMR. You can look at their diffusion coefficients altogether without having to separate them at all. You need to work at low enough concentrations that you don't get solute solute interaction or any type of aggregation, et cetera. But as long as you work in kind of a dilute limit uh, and you're working with systems that don't have aggregation or any of these problems, you can really, you know, the sky's the limit how many components that you want to look at? Uh, so, so a lot of what's out there uh, focuses using uh, pulse field gradients to measure this diffusion, but that, that cuts out a, a large subset of, of potential uh, educational institutions. Um, a lot of primarily undergrad institutions don't have access to research grade experiment, uh, spectrometers or they have a, a range of instrumentation that they may not have this capability. Well, um, even if even research institutions that have a lot of supercon magnets, what's available to undergrads is often, you know, a much simpler instrument, you know, where you can just do basic protons on kind of 60 megahertz, you know, electromagnet systems. So to be able to do something with some of the simpler NMR systems is a huge plus. Right. And so what, what all those systems have in common is the fact that they have the ability to uh, get a homogeneous magnetic field. And to do that, what they have, you know, they have shims, right? And so, yeah, obviously everyone in this audience knows that if you put uh, a single res uh, molecule in, in, in solution and it has, it's in one magnetic field, it has one frequency. If you apply a field gradient, you get a distribution of that frequency. And so what I'm plotting here on the right is simply what happens when you change the, the linear X, Y, or Z shim, um, and you're able to produce these profiles. Well, we can exploit that uh, static field gradient to actually measure diffusion. Yeah, and, and this shows it very clearly, you know, when you're doing just kind of basic spin echo type experiments and it, it falls off exponentially with T2 and that's how you would often even a spin echo is how you would measure the, uh, the transverse relaxation time or T2 in a system. But uh, what often gets left out because you're, you usually have your, 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 your sample shimmed, right? It's in a homogeneous field. So we don't even show this term most of the time. But if you purposely, like you said, take the X, Y, or Z1 shims, the linear uh, gradients that all magnets have associated with them so that you can, you know, so that you can shim or get homogeneous and purposely you know, make it inhomogeneous or linear static gradients, then you can reintroduce this term, which falls off cubically in time, and use that to measure, you know, the diffusion uh, coefficient just by, you know, creating a static linear uh, uh, gradient with a shim coil. 
You know, so if you want to see this in practice, you go put a, a, a sample of, of, of D2O in the magnet. You can see in a perfectly shim magnet, you know, roughly at one hertz line width, you see you have a nice uh, dependence that's only dependent on T2. But then as you increase that static field gradient, your line, line width gets broader and broader, but also that T cubed dependence drop, starts to drop off more dramatically. Yeah, and I think this is just one of the most beautiful examples of all. Like, you have a perfectly, you shim it up, you just, you know, li, you know, just basically de-shim, you know, with one of your X or, or Y1 gradients, and you start mapping out, you make your peaks broader and broader, and, you know, you can see this T cubed term build in, you know, more and more. Right. And so, again, you can have a simple fan, phantom to calibrate this, in this case, uh, an empty capillary tube in the middle. Um, but one thing I do want to point out now is that when you put this into practice, it's best to use an X or a Y shim for a couple of reasons as opposed to a Z shim. The reason is that your sample is wholly contained within the RF coil. So in the Z shim where it's not the case, you have um, problems where you have a B1 field roll off. So you have your image is not, is not clean and precise. But also you have the fact that your, your, your sample may not be centered within the coil and then your probe may not be perfectly centered within your shim set. So you get frequency shifts associated with a Z1 shim that may complicate things. You avoid that by going to an X or Y shim. And this even shows like, you know, I was worried when we first, you know, thought up this, you know, you're probably going to have to make the gradient big enough that you're going to lose so much resolution, which you also lose signal to noise like crazy, you're probably only going to be able to do one component. But as we can see, like you, you get enough of a T cube drop off that, you know, you only have to broaden it, you know, a PPM or less, you know, so you can put several components in there and still be able to resolve them. Now, you know, we're not, you know, fooling anyone. You, you lose so much signal to noise and obviously you're purposely, you know, losing resolution by, by creating an inhomogeneous uh, linear field here. But, um, you know, it, it's still something you can look at multiple components. Not as easy to look at, you know, 10 or more components, but we, you know, show an example here where you can easily look at four. It's pretty easy to see from the spectrum as long as you space them out. Uh, in chemical shift, you could look at, you know, five or six components pretty easily. Uh, one thing I do want to point out though, you have to take two sets of data. You really need to measure the T2 for uh, each component um, in your system prior to introducing the static field to extract the diffusion coefficient. But when yeah. you do, you can see that um, you, it compares quite well with the uh, pulse field gradient method. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I, I think, you know, yeah, we won't belabor that point at all. And it right. just, yeah, I think uh, hopefully we've uh, given a good introduction. This is us at uh, uh, the new School of Molecular Sciences and the Magnetic Resonance Research Center at ASU.